I'm going to bring David Coleman back on the stage and actually switch spots with David because uh, he has put together a presentation for us that's going to help us really understand sort of the challenges of the past and set us up for where we move into the future. So this will be the, the, the jumping off point for our discussion to come. So David Coleman once again. Well, thanks. So um, what I thought we would do, so the topic is the future of science in Canada, scientific research. And um, uh, uh, let, let's start with this. So I have a short presentation about how science really works. Um, now, this is from um, the conservative government of Quebec. It's quoted in the Canadian uh, Medical uh, Journal. Can, I can you drop these lights a bit just so that we can – can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. So, so this is just – this is 2009, arguing that there's a need to generate an economic return. So we – the government puts in billions of dollars in grant money or millions of dollars in grant money, and now we expect something back within a reasonable amount of time. If we put in five, we should be getting back ten. We want to take it to a new level by making strategic choices and focusing our resources where we can achieve the most benefit. So this is a direct, not a bad thought, but it's incomplete. And it's actually been, this is, this is recycled from quite a long time ago. Next uh, slide, please. This is from Lyndon Johnson in 1966. And this revolutionized how science was done in America. He held a strategic council, just like we have. The National Institutes of Health spends $80 million a year. I'm keenly interested, he says, to learn not only what knowledge this buys, but what are the payoffs in terms of healthy lives for our citizens. We must make sure that no life-giving discoveries locked up in the laboratory, as if we would do such a thing. <laughs> but there's the suspicion that scientists don't recognize what they find, um, are diverted from the real task, whatever that is, and that uh, there's no way, and this is why we have such a thing as knowledge transfer today you hear about, how do we bring the discoveries out into the world? Okay? It's not a bad question. Is it the right question? Let's discuss it. Next, please. So how are advances really made? Next. You have to take my word for it, and this is where it's hard because people don't like to take risks. Undirected, non-targeted, curiosity-driven research is the cornerstone, and I would say, of almost all advances, if not all, eventually. Next. Joseph Henry, in 1849, when he formed the Smithsonian Institute, said, The seeds of great discoveries are constantly floating around us, but they only take root in minds well prepared to receive them. In other words, as Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. Good, good. Chance favors the prepared mind. Henry said at first he invented the telegraph. Uh, he was one of the forerunners, the pioneers in the telephone. Brilliant physicist. And, but he recognized that, you know, you have to have a prepared mind. And you can't also, he also said, you can't always be looking for the thing you're going to find. Next, please. Which brings us to the word serendipity, which is really how most discoveries are made, quite seriously. The word entered the, the English lexicon in 1754. It's from a myth about the three princes from the country Serendip, which is now Sri Lanka. Um, and they went around the world making unexpected, marvelous discoveries. And they were as amazed as anybody that they made these discoveries. Next, serendipity. So what's a good example? Well, this is a famous – this is J.P. Morgan, the famous banker. And he commissioned um, – these are kind of eclectic examples, but they serve a purpose. He commissioned Edward Steichen to do his portrait. Steichen comes up, and he was a very ill-tempered, difficult character. So the, Steichen comes up to his, uh, his uh, office, and he's given only a couple of hours to take pictures. At one, and he, he's taking these pictures, and Morgan finally says, that's enough, and he throws them out. And Morgan, um, and so the next couple of days, the films are developed, and Steichen looks, and to his astonishment, next slide, this is what he sees. He has a portrait of Morgan holding a knife. And he says, he calls up and he says, I've got to come back. I've got to come back and, and do this again because the chair, the arm of the chair is a reflection. It looks like you're holding a butcher knife. <laughs> and you're scowling. So, so, so Morgan, Morgan says, let me see. Let me see the photograph. And sure enough, he loved it. 
and it became one of Steichen's most famous portraits, right? Morgan with a butcher knife. Next, please. <laughs> Rentgen, 1894. Rentgen notices that uh, he's playing with a cathode ray tube in his laboratory, and he notices that, that a piece of paper on which he'd put a certain chemical is glowing, and he doesn't know why because there's no light in he, he cuts off all the light in the room. And, uh, and later on, he finds out that there are some photographic plates in a desk drawer near that cathode ray tube, and they're all fogged. And then he deduces, well, there must be some ray I can't, I can't see that's coming from the cathode ray tube. He calls his wife in, has her put her hand on a plate, uh, exposes it to the cathode ray tube, and she sees her bones and her ring. And then in the next year, recognizing that this is a way to see inside the body without damage, it's used clinically to, next slide, to identify buckshot inside a, a farmer who had shot himself in the hand. You see the buckshot, and the surgeon used it to extract, used x-ray to extract the buckshot. It's one year later, now, this is, wasn't locked up in the laboratory. It was immediately used as a technology. Next. Fleming. Fleming has all these Petri dishes on his desk filled with bacterial plates, filled with bacteria, right? He accidentally sneezes on one. Because he was really, he was a kind of a sloppy, he did this on his desk. And he closes it up, puts it aside, comes back a couple of days later, and next slide, this is what he finds. He finds that not only does he see the bacteria, but there's this big spot of mold, and around the mold is a ring of no bacteria. Chance favors the prepared mind. He, he deduces there's something in what he spat onto the plate when he sneezed that killed the bacteria. And for the next... Ten years, he studies these compounds, comes up with penicillin, discovers penicillin, and shares the Nobel Prize with people who, de Flory, who developed a way to, mag to, to make tons of penicillin. Next, please. But what does he say in his Nobel lecture, Fleming? What does he say? Nature makes penicillin. I just found it. One sometimes finds what one is not looking for. He was a, he was a Scottish farmer, remember. So he was a man of few words, and he told the truth. Next. Um, petunias. Why petunias? Okay, petunias, when you try to breed certain uh, stock of red and very red petunias, you get a white stripe. Why? Because the genes that are making the red are turned off when that white stripe is developed, and the, and the result is the white stripe. So people studied this uh, in Arizona. A guy named Richard Jorgensen studied this phenomenon in petunias um, with, buy, with some money, some small amount of money from the government, and it turns out that it's a general principle by which genes are silenced. And this was worked on by other people in other systems. Craig Mello and Andrew Fire got the Nobel Prize for figuring out exactly how this works, not only in petunias, but in us. So this is a way to silence genes. We can study every degenerative disease virtually now using a technology that was first derived from an observation in petunias. Okay, next. Uh, Cyril Clark, Cyril Astley Clark, 1911. He was a, a little boy in England. Uh, his parents sent him to the countryside to avoid the, uh, the terrors of World War I in London, and he developed a passion for how butterflies inherit wing patterns. Years later, after medical school, he's still interested in wing patterns and butterflies. He happens to be having lunch with someone he describes his interest, and that fellow says, you know, you should be studying, actually, if you use the same techniques to study blood groups in humans, you might come up with something interesting. And sure enough, he does this, and a few years later, the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Rogam, the cure for RH factor disease, is discovered, okay, from studying a guy who studied at first the genetics of butterfly inheritance. Next. Hot springs of Yellowstone. The bacteria that allow that live here, the yellow things on the right here, this yellow clump of sulfur-eating bacteria, um, are the basis for the biotechnology industry because they have enzymes that allow them to work at degrees that approach the boiling point of water. Now, the discoverer is a guy named Thomas Brox. Next slide. He discovers these bacteria quite by accident. It would sound reasonable if I were to say that the research work began as a result of a grand design with a vision of the goals in mind. Unfortunately, this would not be true. This work began the day I took a detour through Yellowstone on my way to Seattle. 
He stopped at the, he was fascinated by the hot spring. He took a sample. He went back and he comes up with Thermos aquaticus, the bacteria that they purified and they take the enzymes from. And now the multi, multi, multi billion dollar biotech industry is based on these serendipitous discoveries. Next. Probably the best story. <laughs> Save the best for last. So, so the, the Welsh mining town, they were testing uh, new drugs that were to replace nitroglycerin for cardiac angina, right? Um, they gave out these little blue pills, um, which was a, a product that they thought would, would be better than nitroglycerin, and it had no effect on coronary disease, no better than, than, uh, and, and than uh, nitroglycerin. But then they said, okay, bring back the pills. And the men who were taking the pills, not one of them returned their pills. <laughs> So they call, them, they call them in and they go, where are the pills? Because we've never had this problem before. And they say, well, my dog ate them. Um, my, my wife flushed them. I can't find them. I don't know what. My son stole them. I don't you know. True story. Um, and uh, serendipitously, you know, a multi, another multi-billion dollar industry spawned. Last, please. So it's a famous quote. Um, Warren Chippendale and I love this quote. Serendip serendipity is jumping into a haystack to search for a needle and coming up with the farmer's daughter. N next, please. But now look, so if I was to go back, if I was to come to you, um, my fo I'm a forward-looking guy, and I know. If I say, uh, I'm going to give you $10,000. Can you, can you invent a ray that will allow me to see through the bones in my body or invent a bacteria invent a, a, a mold that will kill bacteria or cure H R H factor or find a way to infinitely reproduce DNA or find a way to silence genes, find a pill that turns an 80-year-old man into a spring chicken. You come back and I'm going to give you a million dollars. You come back in five years and I better have made more than that back. You'd say, well, that's not fair, right? But in retrospect, we can point to these are just, this is a, a fraction of a fraction of a percentage of accidental discoveries that you couldn't anticipate would be made, but have revolutionized the world. So I think it's a good uh, taking off point for our panel. It certainly is. So let us do that. David, thank you.